There's over 5,000 roller coasters throughout the globe, and I'm nerdy enough to have ridden nearly 600 of them. 584 to be exact, I think. Now many of the coasters I've ridden are for children, but I've also been on a long list of noteworthy coasters. Some of them are just 20 minutes away from where I live, and others are located 20 minutes away from the Great Pyramids of Giza in Egypt. That's a weird flex, right? In this video, I'll be ranking my personal favorite 25 roller coasters across the hundreds of coasters I've ridden. Please bear in mind that my rankings may differ heavily from yours. So if you don't like my rankings, before you get triggered enough to report my channel, remember that ranking roller coasters is not scientific and I can declare whatever roller coaster I want as my favorite, even if that is something like Firebird at Six Flags America. Plus, these roller coasters are all within the top 5% of the ones I've ridden. So anything that I mention is something that I consider world class. You got mail. Wait, what? How was that even in the video? Wait, hold on, guys. Whoa, that's weird. Wait, they know where I live? Nah, no way. All right, sorry about that, guys. Let's get back into my top 25 roller coasters. Wait, where's the rest of the video? D did I not edit this? You got mail. Yo, what the? F Another email. Where are you? Ah, this hacker thinks I'm actually in Japan. They've probably never heard of a VPN. I'm currently using Surfshark VPN, the sponsor of today's video. With Surfshark, I can protect my actual location by setting my online location to anywhere in the world. Surfshark also encrypts my internet activity and online data, so I can comfortably browse on public Wi-Fi without any fear of my information being stolen. Start preparing for the holidays today with a 24-month VPN plan from Surfshark. Right now, Surfshark has a great offer, an extra 3 months free and 85% off. Valid until December 31st. Surfshark is available for all your devices and comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Just scan the QR code on screen or click the link in my description and use my promo code ELTORO. Alright, starting off my list of top 25 roller coasters, we have Kong at Six Flags Discovery Kingdom. Just kidding, f*** that ride. My actual number 25 is Goliath at Six Flags Grand America, a ride that I think deserves more love from roller coaster enthusiasts. This topper tracked wooden roller coaster was built by Rocky Mountain Construction, or RMC, and I love the added aggression compared to RMC's 100% steel eye box track. The first drop into the underground tunnel is phenomenal, and I love its unique elements like the first turnaround where you get weird sideways airtime, the hang time filled dive loop within the coaster structure, and the zero G stall, which is my favorite stall on any RMC coaster. I always feel like you stay inverted for too long, as the train snaps right side up just before entering the underground tunnel. On top of that, the ride still provides great moments of ejector airtime. Overall, I love how Goliath is an interesting departure from what RMC normally does with their larger roller coasters. Next up at 24 is Fujiyama, which is Japanese for King of Coasters. It's located at Fuji-Q Highland in Japan, an amusement park near the base of Mount Fuji. Fujiyama takes inspiration from the nearby volcano and opened in 1996 is the world's tallest roller coaster. But in my opinion, even more impressive than the ride's height is its length. Fujiyama feels like an endless roller coaster. And it's technically not the longest roller coaster. That's a record held by another Japanese roller coaster, Seal Dragon 2000. But it manages to feel even longer than the actual record holder. From first drop to final break run, you're looking at a duration of about 100 seconds. And this is without the interruption of a break run or lift hill midway through the ride like on other super long coasters. Now the major downside for most of you would probably be the coaster's lack of intensity, and it's why I don't think many of you would rank this coaster as high as I do. But if you're like me, you'll love the ride's endlessly long drops, great moments of floater airtime, and overall janky turns in banking that remind you that Fujiyama is 100% a roller coaster built by Togo, a manufacturer who has built some of the world's roughest roller coasters. At number 23, we have Magnum XL200 at Cedar Point, the world's first hyper coaster. What I love about Magnum is it's a coaster that was far too big for the time period it was designed and constructed in. Magnum was conceptualized without the use of computer-aided design and was built with hand-bent track. And man, can you feel that. This is old-school roller coaster design and construction built at a colossal scale. The use of continuous radiuses and straight lines, like on the ride's ending bunny hills, cause excessive jerks that give the ride so much character. In today's day and age, where smooth roller coasters are the norm, it's not a ride for everyone. But if you're in for a more old-school roller coaster that is too big for itself, Magnum is the perfect ride for you. My favorite seat on the coaster will forever be the Magic Seat. Car 1 
Row 3, where you truly feel the tangent radius design of the coasters ending bunny hills that deliver some of the punchiest moments of ejector airtime out there. Next up at number 22 is Railblazer at California's Great America. I recently had the opportunity to ride this coaster again after not riding it since 2018, and I thought Railblazer blew me away back then, but I found it even crazier this time around. Without question, this RMC single rail has to be one of the most intense things I've ever experienced. Each of my rides in the back car left me speechless, and I came off the coaster saying that was too much. The train charges through all of its elements to the point where you feel powerless to the ride's insanity. The first drop in the back car delivers ridiculous ejector airtime, and every element that follows is completely insane. Now I haven't had the pleasure of riding Wonder Woman at Six Flags Fiesta Texas, which I hear somehow runs faster than Railblazer. But compared to the much tamer Jersey Devil coaster at Six Flags Great Adventure, Railblazer is completely mental. At number 21, we have Maverick at Cedar Point, which has managed to shoot its way back up my list. I first rode Maverick in 2010 when I was 14 and I loved it, but ever since, I just haven't found the ride as relentless as my first rides. Well, my rides in August of 2022 brought back the ferocious Maverick I remembered, probably because I finally rode it at night. Not only is Maverick an interesting roller coaster with its LSM powered lift hill and second launch midway through, it's also snappy, intense, and just an overall really fun experience. In every seat of the three car train, the 95 degree first drop is more powerful than other drops through times its size. Its quick snaps and transitions on the beginning S turns and ending stangle dives are fierce and overall my favorite quality of the coaster. There's even a few moments of ejector airtime along its satisfying duration of track, and at just 105 feet tall, Maverick proves that it's not all about size but how you use it. Next up at number 20 is Mr. Freeze at Six Flags Over Texas specifically the retired experience, Mr. Freeze Reverse Blast, where trains were launched from the station backwards. I haven't ridden the coaster since the trains were reversed to launch forward again, but luckily the reverse experience still exists on the clone of Mr. Freeze at Six Flags St. Louis, which I've yet to ride. Anyway, Mr. Freeze is one of the most intense coasters I've ever ridden. It packs high amounts of positive g-forces into its layout between pulling into and out of the top hat, and especially following the drop back down the vertical spike as you get slammed into your seat and haul through the overbank turn. The major downside though is that the coaster is quite short, but it makes up for that with other amazing qualities, like its floater airtime on the twist up and down the top hat, and I just can't get enough of the vertical spike as the train ascends higher and higher as you watch the ground grow further away. Then getting launched back down at the ground is just insane. Overall, Mr. Freeze is a unique and intense attraction, and I hope I still enjoy it just as much with trains launching forwards instead of backwards. But if not, hopefully Six Flags St. Louis will keep their Mr. Freeze in the reverse direction, and the coaster will actually be open the next time I'm at St. Louis. At number 19, we have Millennium Force at Cedar Point. This gentle giant opened in 2000 as the world's first complete circuit coaster to top 300 feet in height. And 22 years later, it still brings the heat. It has some of my favorite coaster trains. They're both comfortable and open, and I love its lap bars that keep you secure but allow for a sensation of freedom not found on many coasters. Then combine that with the ride's endless 300 foot drop, low to the ground high speed turns, and moments of sustained floater airtime, and you've got a winner in my eyes. Now just like Fujiyama, Millennium Force is not an overly intense roller coaster, and to me, that's perfectly fine. A roller coaster doesn't need to be ridiculously intense to be good, and Millennium Force feels more like an art piece to me. To be fair, Millennium still has its intense moments, like the high number of positive Gs at the bottom of the first drop into the first overbank turn, and take a ride on Millennium when it's running below 60 seconds from first drop to final break run, and you'll feel a lot more positive G-forces around the track than you might normally. Overall, Millennium is a roller coaster that that I find pure fun. Objectively, it's not the best roller coaster at Cedar Point, but it'll probably remain my personal favorite at the park for years to come. Next up at number 18 is our first wooden roller coaster, Gold Striker at California's Great America. Without question, Gold Striker is my favorite roller coaster built by Great Coasters International that I've at least ridden, as the GCIs in China look insane. But I think this coaster brings together all the best qualities of a classic twister wooden coaster. Even the pre-lift section is fun and manages to get good pacing and lateral g-force is going. Then the first drop within the tunnel is just an amazing experience, and afterwards it feels like the train never slows down. You are sent flying around the compact layout racing through speed hills filled with airtime, fast paced turnarounds with airtime pops as well, and a crazy ending where you ascend to one of the quickest double ups I know of. The overall pacing of the attraction is relentless, and you hardly have a second to catch your breath. And the coaster isn't perfectly smooth, which is something I love in a wooden coaster. It just makes it feel more alive. At number 17, we have Phantom 
Sam's revenge at Kennywood, this Morgan hypercoaster is truly revolutionary. The ride originated as an arrow looping roller coaster in 1991, and thanks to its location on the side of a ravine, its second drop is far larger than its first drop. For the 2001 season, the ride underwent a major renovation where Morgan Manufacturing kept the ride's original lift hill and second hill, but removed the coaster's four inversions and completely redid the coaster's second half, adding a massive helix and a bunch of ejector airtime hills. The company even reused the ride's existing trains and added a new lap bar restraint. Now, I never rode the original Steel Phantom, a ride that I probably still would have liked, but Phantom's Revenge seems like a great improvement. The lap bars are insanely comfortable and allow for ample amount of airtime. The ride layout is top notch, and I love the gigantic second drop down the ravine as you dive underneath the park's wooden coaster Thunderbolt. And the ending bunny hills with their pops of ejector airtime is just icing on the cake. Phantom's Revenge is a winner. Next up at number 16 is Flying Dinosaur at Universal Studios Japan. This B&M flying roller coaster truly stands out from the rest. Compared to other flying coasters, this is fast paced and intense the entire way through, and even off offers moments of airtime on a flying roller coaster. I've always been a fan of flying coasters, especially the ones that B&M build. They exert unique g-forces, and Flying Dinosaur takes that to the next level. If you thought something like Manta at SeaWorld Orlando is intense, you need to try out Flying Dinosaur. It even has a great first drop. It's steep and leads to a pop of airtime for riders in the back cars. The 540 degree roll that follows is extremely disorienting, and the coaster essentially has two pretzel loops thanks to the on your back ascent into the large raven turn. I honestly went to Flying Dinosaur expecting a good B&M flying coaster and got off having ridden what I consider one of B&M's best roller coasters period. In my case, it's a shame because the coaster is located so far from where I live, but for anyone who lives in Japan, your country is home to an extraordinary roller coaster. At number 15 is the problematic lightning rod at Dollywood. This launching RMC topper tracked slash steel eyebox tracked coaster is always a great time, when it's open at least. The uphill launch is always fun. Its first drop into the ravine is spectacular, and to me, this is one of those coasters that gets better the further and further you go into its layout. With the way the ride currently runs, the first few hills are a bit tame for an RMC coaster. You've got a great wave turn that delivers a good punch of sideways floater airtime. Following is a twist and shout which kicks up the intensity as you are quickly whipped from side to side. And then the end of the ride is basically an endless series of ejector airtime hills including the famous quad down, which is really more of a quintuple down. I will admit that I preferred the coaster when it was 100% a topper tracked wood coaster as it was rougher and edgier, but overall, the use of steel eyebox track throughout much of the layout doesn't really change much for me either. At number 14, we have Skyrush at Hershey Park. Intamin and Hershey absolutely cram this 200 foot tall hypercoaster into a tiny plot of land, and I don't believe the resulting ride experience is what Hershey Park originally desired. Skyrush is intense, like stupidly intense. The first drop features a nasty kink on the way down that suddenly ejects riders from their seats on top of the airtime they were already receiving. The valleys of the coaster are extremely tight, delivering high doses of positive g-forces to riders, and the low heights of the following hills lead to nearly excessive amounts of negative g-forces. And thanks to the odd design of the restraints and seats, the airtime almost feels like your torso is separating from your lower body, especially during the coaster's lateral moments where you're whipped side to side. It also doesn't help that the entire train rattles its way through the high-speed valleys. Overall, it's a great recipe for an uber-intense coaster. I personally love Skyrush, but I can see why others may not. Its layout isn't very exciting, and a lot would probably consider it too intense or too uncomfortable, because its restraints are absolute garbage. But for me, the overall intensity of the ride wins me over. At number 13, we have Twisted Timbers at King's Dominion. To me, this is the king of the quote, smaller sized RMC coasters, at least the ones that I've ridden so far. I prefer its overall layout and pacing to rides like Wicked Cyclone at Six Flags New England or even Storm Chaser at Kentucky Kingdom. Although Untamed at Wallaby Holland looks like a worthy contender that could best Twisted Timbers. The attraction is a hybrid conversion of the former Hurler wooden roller coaster and it's just spectacular. You've got the barrel roll down drop, then three great back-to-back -back ejector airtime hills, a floaty cutback inversion, and some serious moments of ejector airtime on the ride's ending series of bunny hills. It's a great contrast from the park's other star attraction, Intimidator 305, and truly helps boost the ride lineup at King's Dominion. Overall, Twisted Timbers is a much better attraction than Hurler ever was and is one of the best coasters in Virginia. Next at number 12, we have Fury 325 at Carowinds, which is not only one of the world's most visually striking roller coasters, but is also one of the world's best. This B&M Giga Coaster is the world's tallest with a 
lift hill. And unlike the other B&M Giga coasters currently in existence, it features a wonderfully long layout. Slightly longer than Millennium Force actually. But unlike Millennium, it does so much more within its layout in terms of ride elements. You are constantly flying into or out of low to the ground turns and twists, strong airtime hills, and underground tunnels. The pacing of the coaster is immaculate and almost feels as if Intamin and B&M collaborated on this project. The ride also features substantially stronger airtime than what you'd find on most B&M coasters, and the low to the ground twists and turns at the start of the ride are pure bliss. The sideways airtime on the treble clef is also fantastic. Without question, Fury 325 is one of the world's greatest roller coasters, and I can totally see this being a number one roller coaster for not only coaster enthusiasts, but members of the general public. At number 11, we have Ghost Rider at Knott's Berry Farm. This wooden roller coaster is currently my favorite ride in all of California, although I'm in major need of a re-ride on X2 to reevaluate it. Ghost Rider is another one of those coasters that just gets better and better the further into the layout. It begins with the first drop that is nothing special, and some of the other opening hills don't do too much, but the first floater airtime hill is great, and there's still a lot of great moments of lateral g-forces. Then all hell breaks loose when you plummet off the mid-course break run into the ride's second half, where the airtime begins to feel stronger, the lateral g-forces get more intense, and the coaster just doesn't slow down. Plus, you're racing within the structure of the ride, making it feel even faster. Ghost Rider ends with a practically unbanked helix, leaving you pinned to the side of your seat the entire time. Time. I only wish that Knott's Berry Farm would make it more of an initiative to run the coaster at a higher capacity. Waiting in line for Ghost Rider is absolutely dreadful and I hope someone from park management hears this. Starting off my exclusive list of top 10 roller coasters, we have Shivering Timbers at Michigan's Adventure. At just 122 feet tall, this coaster manages to stretch a total length of 5,383 feet. For its pretty small height, the ride literally never ends and it's jam packed with airtime hill after airtime hill, with each one delivering a nearly perfect amount of floater airtime. The coaster is just hill after hill, and it even features great lateral forces on the turnaround at the far end of the coaster, as well as the massive ending helix that in itself feels endless. Rides like the Voyage at Holiday World and Steel Vengeance at Cedar Point are known for their abundant amount of airtime, but I think Shivering Timbers takes the crown for having the longest duration of airtime on any coaster. At least it feels that way to me. Next up at number 9 is Superman El Altimo Escape at Six Flags Mexico. This Morgan Hypercoaster was one that caught me completely off guard. I had heard almost nothing about the coaster going in and walked off the ride in complete awe of what I experienced. This is also a coaster that gets better and better the further you ride into the layout. The first drop and second hill are pretty similar to something like Mamba at Worlds of Fun, but the intensity picks up coming down the second drop. You're suddenly hit with a high amount of lateral forces that are honestly rare on steel coasters. The first helix leaves you pinned to the side of your seat, and the following airtime hill is just ridiculous, and it leads into another helix sending you flying to the left while you're still getting airtime. When the ride runs less than three trains, it's guaranteed that you fly through the block break mid-ride and you get huge punches of strong floater airtime the rest of the ride. I went to Mexico City thinking Medusa's steel coaster would be my favorite, but Superman easily took that title for me. And now we're at a point in the list where I feel like any of these coasters could be my number one, but at number eight, we have Outlaw Run at Silver Dollar City. This RMC top retract wood coaster is absolutely ferocious. It features some of RMC's best ride elements and hugs the hilly terrain of its surroundings. It also runs with a set of steel wheels, unlike most of RMC's other coasters that run with a softer polyurethane wheel, which makes Outlaw Run feel more like a traditional wood coaster. The first drop dives into the woods below, delivering insane airtime, and there isn't a single dead moment on the entire coaster. You're flying between low to the ground airtime hills, there's even an overbank turn with airtime, and then a massive wave turn that sends you flying down the hillside only to climb back up through back to back barrel rolls filled with hang time. And a night ride on Outlaw Run is just truly spectacular. At least it was the last time I rode in 2019. I hear that more lights may have been installed to light the coaster up at night, but either way, this is a coaster I'm itching to get back on. Next up at number 7 is Intimidator 305 at King's Dominion. The best way that I can describe Intimidator 305 is that it combines the intensity of Maverick and Skyrush and then takes it to a colossal scale. The ride's 300 foot drop plummets you into a tight helix where I gray out nearly every single time. What follows is one of the craziest coaster layouts out there. You've got a camelback half the size of the lift hill with great sustained airtime. 
followed by a long stretch of track not far off the ground, filled with quick snaps, airtime, forceful turns, and S-bends that snap you from left to right or vice versa. They're just like the snaps of Maverick but even crazier. And lately, the ride doesn't seem to trim as much on the second large airtime hill, making the ending stretch absolutely ridiculous. The last S-bend practically murders you. Intimidator 305 is absolutely ferocious and it's definitely a coaster I need to ride more often. I don't live that far away from King's Dominion and I should probably visit the park more often. At number 6, we have Steel Vengeance at Cedar Point, a roller coaster that has gotten pretty popular to hate on. And I may have contributed to that in the past, but after riding it more, the ride is undeniably good. Honestly, it's unreal. The track layout is already insanely long, but it manages to pack in a ridiculous number of hills and elements. And it does so without having a single dead moment on the entire coaster, well except for the block break. But hey, the Steel Vengeance crew can be so efficient that the block break is actually put to use. Shouts out to the 2022 Vengeance crew who hit 1 million riders in a single season for the first time in the ride's history. Going back to the review, the block break makes for a perfect division between the first and second half of the ride. The first half is filled with larger airtime hills delivering sustained moments of ejector air, where the second half is filled with smaller hills delivering airtime pop after airtime pop. And I love how much of the second half of the ride takes place within the coaster structure, just like Ghost Rider. Without question, Steel Vengeance is objectively the best coaster at Cedar Point, even if Millennium Force is oddly my personal favorite. Next up at number 5 is Iron Gwazi at Busch Gardens Tampa Bay. This RMC hypercoaster has probably one of the best layouts out there. Every single one of its elements is really good, and there's a lot of things it does better than other RMC coasters. On paper, its first drop is a minor improvement to something like Steel Vengeance's first drop, but it executes so much better, especially with it diving within another part of the coaster. The outward banked helix of an airtime hill that follows is nuts, and the death roll is straight up ridiculous. While it's not the longest coaster in duration, it's a good amount longer than some of the other coasters on my list, and it makes up for that with its incredible elements and pacing like the twist and shout over the back of the station. My only regret is that I've only ridden Iron Gawazi very early in its career back on its media day in February. I hear the coaster is broken and wonderfully, and I bet if I had ridden it again after media day, I'd rank the ride even higher than I already do. At number 4, we have the Voyage at Holiday World. This Gravity Group Woody feels like a hyper coaster and uses the hillside it's built on to its advantage. With a 154 foot first drop, the ride manages to stretch a length of 6,442 feet without the use of a second lift hill. And even after all this track, it comes flying into its final brake run. Honestly, the ride is a literal unicorn. It's like an updated version of Shivering Timbers that sacrifices in its number of traditional airtime hills, but adds a high amount of inspired twists and turns as well as the benefit of being a terrain coaster. The outbound section of track heads uphill as riders coast over several floater airtime hills. Then all hell breaks loose on the far end spaghetti bowl where you twist and turn your way through airtime hills and two 90 degree bank turns. Then the ending run to the station is absolutely absolutely insane as the train travels downhill the entire way, gradually getting faster and faster as you ride over small airtime hills and fly through banked turns. It's honestly a masterpiece and Holiday World does a great job maintaining this wonderful wooden coaster. Kicking off my top 3 roller coasters, we have the Jurassic World Velocicoaster at Universal's Islands of Adventure at number 3. To me, Velocicoaster embodies all the innovative and extraordinary qualities of a modern day attraction into one package. The ride is well presented and looks great in the sky skyline of Islands of Adventure. It has a great theme and standing in the ride area and even waiting in line for the attraction feels like an experience. And the seating and the restraints of the ride vehicles are both safe and extremely comfortable. It even has excellent rider capacity, meaning its long line moves at a quick pace. And then the coaster itself is out of this world. This multi-launching Intamin roller coaster starts with a quote tamer first half that still manages to deliver strong pops of airtime as you whiz around the raptor paddock. Then the intensity cranks up a notch as you accelerate down a second launch track, sending you into a run of some of the best roller coaster elements out there as you fly over the park midways. The ending Mosasaurus roll over the water is just pure bliss as you get shot out of your seat while upside down. For thrill seekers, this might be the best all around theme park attraction out there. At number 2, we have El Toro at Six Flags Great Adventure, the roller coaster that gives this channel half its identity. When this intimate prefabricated wood coaster isn't derailing or fracturing its structure, 
Sorry, too soon? It manages to deliver one of the best coaster experiences I know of. It combines the thrills of a wooden coaster with the intensity of something like a steel hypercoaster. It's like a wooden sky rush. There are loads of head choppers as you dive within the coaster's wooden structure, and several moments of sustained ejector airtime. The first drop is just incredible and something that all thrill seekers should experience in the back car. Then the following two camelbacks provide my two favorite moments of airtime out there. The middle of the coaster is a bit tame compared to the beginning, but still has its moments like a great moment of floater airtime here for riders in the back of the train. Then the ending of the coaster kicks off with a head chopping turn into another ejector airtime hill, followed by a quick slam of positive G's as you enter the twister section, where you twist left and right at a high speed. As forceful as it is, El Toro is a coaster I can ride over and over again, and I don't get bored of it either, which is good because it's easily my most ridden roller coaster. It's time for the moment you've been waiting for. Coming in at number one, we have the unopened Wild Mouse at Cedar Point. The San Perla Strata Coaster <laughs> at number one is Ejanica at Fuji Q Highland. This SNS fourth dimension roller coaster is literally the craziest attraction I have ever been on. It takes the concept of X2 but pushes the boundaries even further. Your seats flip faster, the pacing of the coaster is overall faster, and your seats rotate more in general. Roller coasters honestly never scare me anymore, but the first drop of Edge Nika actually terrified me. I keep saying that I will make a full review video on this coaster, and I'm finally going to do that. Coming later this month, I will have a full video on why Edge Nika is the craziest roller coaster in the world. And if that video is already available when you're watching this video, please click the i card in the corner. So that will wrap up my list of top 25 roller coasters. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I hope to add more roller coasters to my collection in 2023. Please comment below what you thought of my list and how yours differs from mine. And feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Alright, thanks for watching everyone. I'll catch you all in my next video. Peace.